All right, welcome back to another episode of Science with Serbeck. Today, what we're going to be talking about is acid base and redox reactions. So, before we get into the video, I just want to outline a couple of, of objectives that you should be able to accomplish by the end of this video. So, number one, be able to define what an acid or a base is. Objective number two, uh, given an acid or base in a chemical reaction, you should be able to correctly predict the products. And then objective number three, uh, determine whether a chemical reaction involves oxidation and reduction. Objective number four is to assign oxidation numbers to atoms and molecules and ions. And objective number three, use the activity series to predict whether a reaction will occur when a metal is added to an aqueous solution of either a metal salt or an acid. And if that happens, write the balanced uh, equation and be able to identify the net ident ionic equation. So let's go ahead, let's get into our details of notes here. And we start out here with acids. So acids are just defined as substances that are able to ionize in aqueous solutions to form H plus or hydronium ions. Again, this H plus, uh, we call that a hydronium ion. And, and we'll see why here when we get into acids and bases a little bit more in depth in this class. But one thing to note about acids is that they are proton donors because they donate an H plus ion. Now we can further classify acids based upon how many H pluses they're able to donate. So the first class of acid is known as a monoprotic acid. And monoprotic acids can ionize to form one H plus ion. And so an example of this would be something like hydrochloric acid. Now another type of, of acid is a diprotic acid. And a diprotic acid is an acid that ionized to form two H plus ions, or those hydro hydronium ions. An example of a diprotic acid would be something like sulfuric acid. And so in this formula here, the formula for sulfuric acid is H2SO4, and it, because it has two H's to be able to be donated, it is considered a diprotic acid. Now, our our other class of acid is a triprotic acid. And a triprotic acid are acids that ionize to form three H plus ions. And so an example of a triprotic acid would be something like phosphoric acid. And the formula for phosphoric acid is H3PO4. So again, you can see there is three H's that are able to be donated, and so that's where we get that triprotic acid, or three of those H pluses can be donated. So now we can shift gears. We have a, a real general idea of what acids are, and we can shift gears to a very generic definition of bases. So bases are defined as substances that accept or react with those H plus ions. Now, bases are proton acceptors because they accept an H plus ion. Now, something else that's really important to note here with bases is that they produce hydroxide, OH minus, when they're dissolved in water. Now, we can also classify bases into two general categories. The first category is known as an ionic hydroxide compound. And these ionic hydroxide compounds include things like sodium hydroxide, NaOH, uh, potassium hydroxide, or something like calcium hydroxide. Again, these are all examples 
but notice how they contain OH or that hydroxide compounds. Now, what we can also have are compounds that don't contain hydroxides, but can accept a proton. An example of this would be something like NH3, ammonia. NH3 here, and if I write this down, NH3, it can accept a proton. So let's just say hypothetically it accepts an H plus ion, and it can form that ammonium ion. Again, because our NH3 ammonia compound here accepted that H plus, by definition, we can classify that as a base. Now, notice here how it did not have hydroxide, but it could still accept a proton. Okay, so now we have a, a base idea uh, for bases and acids, and we can get a little bit more complex, and we will, but now we can turn our attention to specifically identifying strong acids versus strong bases, and then also weak acids versus weak bases. So we'll shift our gears here to strong acids first. Now, strong acids, um, strong acids, what they are, are they are defined as any compound that can completely be ionized in a solution. And so what I mean by completely ionized is that 100% of those ions, when we dissolve it in water, break apart into those positive ions and there's negative ions. So there's none of the compound left sitting all together once you mix up that solution. They are all dissolved into ions. Now, for our acids, to be considered a strong acid, we have seven different strong acids. The first acid that is strong is hydrochloric acid, or HCl. The second strong acid is hydrobromic acid, or HBr. The third strong acid is hydroiodic acid, or HI. The fourth strong acid is chloric acid, or HClO3. The fifth strong acid is perchloric acid, or HClO4. The sixth strong acid is sulfuric acid, or h 2 so fear. The seventh strong acid is nitric acid or HNO3. Again, these are the seven strong acids and it or these need to be memorized. Now, strong bases. I, I should have left a little room here, but strong bases are also strong elect electrolytes that completely ionize in solution. Now, strong bases can have two different categories. Uh, the way we know that one thing is a strong base is if it's a group 1A metal hydroxide. And so if we're looking at the periodic table here, remember group 1A are, are metals, go from lithium all the way down to francium. So anything in this first column that combines with a hydroxide is considered to be a strong base. Now, the other type of strong bases that we have are heavy group 2A metal hydroxides. And so what we mean by heavy metal uh, hydroxides there, or heavy 2A metal hydroxides, is things such as calcium, barium, or strontium. So to be a heavy group 2A uh, metal hydroxide, we would have something like calcium hydroxide, barium hydroxide, or strontium hydroxide. And again, what you can see here is those are all what we consider heavy group 2A uh, hydroxides. So again, group 2A, calcium, strontium, barium, those would be considered our particular 
uh, strong bases or one part of a strong base. Now, with weak acids and weak bases, so if you're not these things up here that we talked about, you are uh, considered a weak acid or weak acid or weak base. And what we have um, is a couple different ways that we uh, classify these. And so the first way that, that we can distinguish that we have a weak acid or weak base is these are compounds that in solution they form weak electrolytes and are only partially ionized in aqueous solutions. So again, to, to put it simply here, uh, if they aren't something that we listed as a strong base or one of our seven strong acids, they're considered, if they're considered to be an acid or base, and they're not one of these things, they are a weak acid or base. That's an easy way to remember it. So now we can talk a little bit more in depth about this electrolyte business. And for us, we're gonna put some chemistry terms with these electrolytes. And we're, we're gonna start out with just a term for a strong electrolytes. So a strong electrolytes has two different uh, categories or two different uh, way we can know it's a strong electrolyte. Number one, they are soluble ionic compounds. And then the other way we know that we have a strong electrolyte is that if we have a molecular compound that is a strong acid. So an example would be something like sulfuric acid or nitric acid where, hey, that thing is a molecular compound, but it's one of the strong acids. And so that would be an example. Now, how we identify if we have a weak electrolyte is anything that is a weak acid or base. And a non-electrolyte, uh, what a non-electrolyte is any compound that is not ionic a strong acid or weak acid or base. So a good example of a non-electrolyte, a good example would be water or H2O. Now to help identify if something is strong, weak, or a non-electrolyte, we have some different compounds here. So we have calcium chloride. Well, calcium chloride is ionic. So this one right here, number one, this would be a strong electrolyte. Nitric acid, now it's a molecular compound, but remember, it is one of those seven strong acids. So this would also be a strong electrolyte. Now, we have ethanol, uh, which ethanol here, this H can be donated. If it's donating an H, and it's not one of those seven strong acids, it's considered a weak acid. So ethanol would be considered a weak electrolyte. And then we have acetic acid. Again, this H out in front can be donated. And so what happens here is we can classify this as a weak electrolyte. Okay, so now we can uh, move on here um, to writing some acid bases uh, example equations. So we have a little bit of knowledge about acid bases. Now we can actually move to our particular equations. So we wanna write a balanced chemical equation between aqueous hydrochloric acid and sodium sulfate. And excuse me, that's sulfide. All right, so hydrochloric acid. Uh, again, hydrochloric acid, we should be getting familiar with the names, but hydrochloric acid has the formula HCl. So we start out with HCl. Then we react it with sodium sulfide. So sodium, remember, has an Na1 plus charge. Sulfide has an S2 minus charge. So when they form a compound, we get Na2, S. And one thing I, I did not, I failed to do, is I forgot to put the state of matter. So aqueous hydrochloric acid is AQ. Sodium sulfide is also aqueous. So we put AQ and they react together. So again, what happens here? 
It's like a double replacement reaction. And so now the H and the S combine together. So now we have H one plus and S two minus. Well, they form, if we, if we do this correctly, they form H2S. And now anytime for us, we have hydrogen combined with sulfur. Anytime we have sulfur combined with hydrogen, this is going to produce a gas. Now our other compounds that combine together is Na and Cl. So again, Na has a plus one charge. Cl has a minus one charge. So this becomes NaCl and NaCl, if you look on your solubility guidelines, is aqueous, AQ. Now, we have to balance this. So we have one H on the left, two on the right. So we put a two coefficient out in front. Now we have uh, two Cl's. We only have one Cl, so we put a two out in front. Then we go to sodiums. We have two Na's. Over here on the right, we have two Na's, so they're balanced. And then we have one S on the left and one S on the right. So right there, that equation is balanced. Remember, sulfur with hydrogen is gonna form that gas. That's really important when we get to the states of matter. So now down here, we wanna write a balanced chemical equation between aqueous phos phosphorus acid and potassium hydroxide. So phosphorus acid, uh, remember it's not phosphoric acid because that would make uh, the formula PO4, it's phosphorus acid. So phosphorus acid, to save some time here, is H3PO3. So we get H3PO3. One of the weak acids, it's aqueous, so AQ. It reacts with potassium hydroxide. Now, potassium has a, a symbol of K with a one plus charge. Hydroxide has a charge of OH with a one minus charge. You combine those together and potassium hydroxide becomes aqueous in the formula KOH. So these things react together they switch partners. So now the K combines with the uh, phosphide ion. So you have K1 plus with PO3, three minus. So when we do the formula here, uh, potassium, potassium phosphide becomes K3PO3. Now, what happens here is your H and your OH formed together. So H plus and OH minus. Now if you put those two things together, you'd get HOH, or whenever you see HOH, you have water, so H2O. Now H2O, when we have it in two aqueous solutions combined, this forms a liquid. So it's important to identify, hey, we have a liquid water, or if we have a gas compound like we did above. Uh, we're still not quite done. We gotta balance this. And so what we do to balance it, I am gonna save the H's to the end. Then I'm gonna look at PO3s. Now the reason I look at PO3s together is because they're the same on the left and right hand side. So they're both one, and they're both one. So hey, they're balanced. We move on to potassiums. Potassium has one on the left, and on the right they have three. So to make this a three, we just put a three coefficient out in front. And then uh, we can have our oxygens. Now, remember oxygen, we already counted PO3 as a chunk. So I like to, to blank that out. And then I have three times one oxygens over here. Again, I already blanked this out, I already balanced it. I only have one, so I put a coefficient of three. So here's why I save the, the hydrogens to the end. If you count closely, I have three hydrogens plus three times one, total of six. Over here on the right, I have three times two, which is a total of six. So right now, this particular equation is balanced. All right, so again, sulfur with hydrogen produces a gas, H2O, 
in two aqueous solutions here with an acid base reaction is going to produce our water or H2O and it's going to be in the liquid form. So now what we can do is we can shift gears to our, our other type or our final main type of, of reaction here and that is our redox reactions. So we start out here we start out here with a redox reaction and so a redox reaction just is defined as a reaction that involves the transfer of electrons between reactants. Now redox reactions can also be called oxidation reduction reactions. Okay so we can look a little bit more here into oxidation. So what oxidation is or when it occurs is when a substance loses loses an electron. So a good example of this uh, would be what we have here. Uh, so let's say we have solid iron Fe and it has uh, no charge right now and let's say it undergoes oxidation and it loses electrons. So if it lost electrons, let's say it loses three electrons, it would be now an Fe3 plus ion. And then those three electrons, again, would be lost. They would be uh, donated to another reactant if we were going through a redox reaction. So on the flip side, we have our reduction. And so a reduction is when a substance gains an electron or electrons. So an example of this would be, let's say we have copper 2 plus. We have copper 2 plus. Let's say it gains two electrons to come back to be neutrally charged. So because it acquired two electrons and got reduced, becomes just copper Cu. So if we put this together in a full-fledged example, what we have is this. Let's say we have calcium, solid calcium, and oxygen gas combine together to form calcium oxide. What happens here is calcium, in this case, becomes positively charged. So calcium here is oxidized. And oxygen, because it gained electrons, it became a two minus charge, it would be reduced, okay? And we'll get into to more details about how to go through that. So now what we can get into is we can talk about oxidation states. And this will help us determine what gets oxidized and what gets reduced. So we move over here to our oxidation states. So oxidation states are just defined as a positive or negative whole number assigned to an element in a molecule or ion. And so the reason we assign oxidation states is that it helps keep track of electrons during chemical reactions. And then these oxidation states can also be referred to as oxidation numbers. So now we have some guidelines to help us determine our oxidation states of certain elements. So the first set of guidelines here is that for an atom in its elemental form, the oxidation number is always zero. For any monoatomic ion, the oxidation number equals the charge on the ion, positive for metals and negative for nonmetals. For oxygen, the oxidation number is usually 2. And I should have specified it's a negative 2 charge. Now, the exception is peroxides, O2, 2 minus. In that case, each oxygen only has a negative 1 charge. For hydrogen, it has an oxidation number of plus one when bonded to nonmetals and negative one when bonded to um, metals. For fluorine, the oxidation number is always negative one, and that is a negative one. 
Now, most other halogens also have a negative one charge in binary compounds. Now, in a compound, the sum of all oxidation numbers is zero. And I should have specified there, that is neutral compounds. Neutral compounds, you sum up or you add up all the oxidation numbers, and it should equal zero. Now, the sum of oxidation numbers in polyatomic ions equals the charge of that ion. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll put some of these to the test, uh, but the, the reason that we went over these particular guidelines is this. Uh, what, what's really important here is that we have to apply this to redox reactions. And so remember, uh, if a substance is reduced, it's going to have an oxidation number that decreases. And substances that are oxidation, oxidized has an oxidation number that increases. So those are some important things to, to remember as we go through some of these example problems. Uh, all right, so uh, putting this knowledge to the test, uh, we want to determine the oxidation number of sulfur in the following compounds. So we have H2S, okay? So again, the first way or the easiest way to think about how to do this is divide my compound here into its individual components or elements. Now remember, when hydrogen is bonded to a nonmetal, which sulfur is, it's going to have a charge of 1 plus. So if, a, uh, if one, just one of these hydrogens has a charge of one plus, we need to multiply it by how many hydrogens we have. So we have two. So this means the total positive charge has to be a total of positive two. And that's because you have two hydrogens that each have a positive one charge. Now, in our uh, final uh, category here, number six, the guideline says the sum of the oxidation numbers in a neutral compound is zero. So that means we have to think of just one sulfur times the charge needs to add together with a positive two to equal zero. So what this means is that sulfur in H2S has to have an oxidation number of negative two because there's one sulfur, so one times negative two, plus the total positive charge, positive two, equals zero. So that's how we get a negative two oxidation state. Now we have a little bit more complicated uh, issue here, all right? So now we have sodium sulf sulfite. Um, and the way in which we do this is we first divide the positive from the negative ion. Now we think to ourselves, what is the charge of sodium? Remember, it's in group 1A. So group 1A is going to have a positive charge of a, a plus 1. Now, we have two sodiums in our compound. So we have to multiply this positive 1 by 2. So that means the charge from sodium that is given off is a positive 2. Now what this means about sulfur, what this means about sulfur, uh, or excuse me, sulfide, SO3, this whole thing that I just highlighted in purple here, this whole thing, SO3, has to have an overall charge of minus two. So again, this whole thing has to equal a whole charge of negative two. We want to know, hey, what is the charge of sulfur? So I'm going to make an S, and I'm just going to label that as my variable because I don't know what the charge of sulfur is. But I do know what the charge of oxygen is. So it says for oxi oxygen, the oxidation number is usual, usually negative 2. The only exception here is to peroxides. Now. That right there is not a peroxide. You can look back on your guidelines. So what this means is this. 
Most oxygens are a negative two charge. So in parentheses, I'm gonna write negative two, negative two, and I know it's really small, but that is a negative two. And I'm gonna multiply it by how many oxygens we have. So I'm gonna multiply it by three. And I'm gonna rewrite this to make it look a little cleaner here. So again, we're trying to solve what is the charge for sulfur here. So we have S, negative two times three, plus a negative six equals negative two. Now, this right here would consolidate to S minus six equals negative two. So the charge for S, the charge for S in this second example, we just add six on both sides. The charge for S would equal a positive four. So again, you have to think of the compound as a whole. You have to think about, hey, neutral charges, and then you have to think about those guidelines. So the charge here for sulfur in the second example would be a positive four. Now we get to SO4 two minus. So we have a polyatomic ion, and remember, we always divide or try to divide what we have here and we have to think, okay, this whole overall polyatomic ion has to have a charge of negative two, a total charge of negative two. We don't know what the charge of sulfur is right now, so we're gonna label this as S. But just like in the last time, we can find out what the charge of oxygen is. So the guideline said oxygen has a minus two charge unless it is combined or in a peroxide. Well, SO4 is not a peroxide, and so we can assume that oxygen, each oxygen has a charge of negative two, and so what we do, we multiply it by the number of oxygen atoms that we have, so this becomes four, and so again, we just consolidate this down, so this would be S plus a negative eight, because negative two times four is eight, equals negative two. We consolidate this down. This would be S minus eight equals negative two. And then we add eight to both sides. And the charge for sulfur here would be a positive six. So we have to think about everything that is involved to produce that particular charge. Okay, uh, so that was, was good practice there on going over oxidation here. Now what we wanna say, or now what we wanna do is talking about oxidizing and reducing agents. So an oxidizing agent is defined as a, the substance that makes it possible for another substance to be oxidized. So to put it simply here, the oxidizing agent is the substance that gets reduced or accepts electrons. Now a reducing agent on the other hand is defined as the substance that makes it possible for another substance to be reduced. So in other words, a reducing agent is the substance that gets oxidized or gives away an electron or electrons. Okay, so we'll keep oxidizing and reducing agents in mind as we uh, go through some examples here. Okay, so what we're going to do here we're gonna talk about one more thing, and then we're going to be able to go through some oxidation reduction examples. So with our uh, oxidation reduction examples, if an oxidation occurs uh, by a metal, by acids or uh, salts, we have a couple things happen. Uh, number one, this occurs when a metal reacts with either an acid or a metal salt and what this does it allows displacement or a single replacement reaction to occur and this has a generalized formula that we'll go over and that generalized formula is again generic substance a combines with this compound we'll call bx and then the a bumps out the b so it becomes ax plus B as our products. Okay, so we're gonna combine a lot together here in this example. We wanna write a balanced chemical equation 
uh, and also identify the oxidizing and reducing agent in the reaction between solid iron and aqueous nickel to nitrate. So solid iron, pretty easy there. You look it up on the periodic table. It has the symbol of Fe. The problem said, hey, it is solid uh, iron. It reacts with nickel to nitrate. So right here, nickel to nitrate. Remember, has Ni2 plus charge. Nitrate has NO3 1 minus charge. So the formula for nickel to nitrate becomes Ni NO3 with a 2 charge, or a, excuse me, a 2 subscript. Now, what happens here? is if we follow the generic formula, the metal is going to replace the other metal. So in this case, iron is going to replace nickel. And there's one thing I, I should have add, added, and that is that nickel to nitrate is a Q or aqueous, okay? So what happens here is iron bumps out uh, nitrate. And so iron in this case, and I don't expect you to know it, but iron becomes Fe2 plus charged, and nitrate is still NO3 1 minus. So what happens here is that we get Fe NO3 NO3 2. Okay, now remember nitrates, if you think back to your solubility guidelines, there is no exceptions to these being soluble in water. So that becomes AQ again. Uh, now, nickel gets bumped out and it becomes solid nickel. And it looks like this. Now, I will tell you this, because we have iron two and because we had nickel two, this equation is balanced. You could go through it and test it, but I'm gonna tell you that this uh, particular uh, reaction right now is balanced. Now we have to identify what is the oxidizing and reducing agent. So the easiest way to think about this is what gets oxidized and what gets reduced. And so what we have is a little acronym here. And that acronym here is oil rig. And this helps identify what gets oxidized and what gets reduced. So oxidation, our O, oxidation is loss of electrons. So oxidation, if we lose electrons, we minus a minus charge, we are getting more positive. So, so let's go ahead, let's, let's put a big plus sign right by oil right? You get more positive. Re, uh, reduction, or the, the rig part here, reduction, reduction is gain of electrons, okay? So if we're gaining electrons, we're adding a negative charge. If you're getting reduced, you become more negative. And so that's how I help remember uh, what gets oxidized, what gets reduced. So iron. Iron went from a charge of zero, right, neutral charge, to a charge of two plus. So if it went from zero, it became more positive. Iron, in this case, iron is oxidized. Okay? If it is oxidized, it loses electrons. And from that previous page there, the thing that says it gives away electron is the reducing agent. So iron is oxidized. It is the reducing agent. Nickel nickel is the only other thing that changed its electron count. So nickel, it went from a two plus charge down to zero. So it lost electrons or uh, excuse me, back up, back up. Nickel went from a charge of two plus to zero, so it gained electrons. It became more negative. That's the word I was looking for. So nickel, because it gained electrons, Ni, 
is reduced. It is a substance that is reduced and it gained electrons. And so if you look on the previous page, the thing that accepts those electrons is reduced and it's also the oxidizing oxidizing agent. Okay. All right, so uh, we'll keep moving on here. That's a, that's a pretty good example. Um, but we will move on to what we know as the activity series. So the activity series, what the activity series is, is uh, something that we utilize to help see if a reaction will actually occur. So uh, truly it's defined as a list of metals in order of decreasing ease of oxidation. So in that handy dandy periodic table packet that I give you, I give you that activity series and it says, hey, this is the ease of oxidation. So the more active metals are at the top of this activity series. Now, something we call noble metals, uh, these are metals that are relatively unreactive and they're located at the bottom of the activity series. So now the important thing about this series is that to be oxidized, the solid metal must be higher in the activity series than the metal it is replacing. Again, what that says here, the solid metal must be higher in activity series than the metal it is replacing to be oxidized. So we want to determine if an aqueous solution of iron three chloride oxidizes magnesium metal. And if it does, we wanna write a balanced chemical equation for it. So iron three chloride. Uh, iron three chloride has the symbol of Fe, Cl3 and it is aqueous and it combines with solid magnesium metal. So the solid metal, the way the rules state here, the solid metal, it is going to try to bump out iron in this compound. And so this means that magnesium must be higher than Fe in our activity series. So. The first thing that we do here is we find uh, magnesium. Magnesium is located uh, about the top third, and then we need to find iron, okay? Now, it is iron three plus, which uh, iron three plus, um, we can just use as iron, uh, but iron, is below magnesium on the list. So because the solid metal is above the uh, metal in the compound, it can be replaced. So what this means, yes, a reaction happens. Yes, a reaction happens. And so what we get is we get magnesium chloride, which magnesium chloride has the formula MgCl2. That is aqueous in solution and it is combined or it is uh, bumped out and then we get solid iron. Okay, so iron is reduced and magnesium is oxidized. Now, we're not quite done because we got to balance it and the way we balance it is by putting a two in front of the Fe. We put a three in front of the MgCl2, two in front of the Fe, and then we need a three in front of the Mg. Now, an important note here is this. If, if the activity series tells us that a metal that is trying to do the replacing is below the other metal, we just simply write NR for no reaction. Okay, so we've done a lot with redox reaction. And what we can actually do is we can go one step further and this is getting into the, the baby steps, the little intro to uh, electrochemistry, which electrochemistry just gets its base, just gets its base in uh, redox reactions. So we have half reactions. And so half reactions are defined as an equation 
for either an oxidation or a reduction that explicitly shows the electrons involved. And so what we can do with half reactions is we can use them to balance oxidation reduction reactions. All right, so let's go over the steps here uh, to go through this process. Uh, so step number one, write down the two incomplete half reactions. And I should mention that this is in a acidic solution. So it's, it's balancing half reactions when we have an acidic solution. And with this first step here, uh, remember, there should be one oxidation half reaction, and there should also be one reduction half reaction. The second step is to balance each half reaction. So there's a series of sub-steps sub here. Uh, first, you need to balance elements other than H and O, or hydrogen and oxygen. The second thing that you need to do here is balance oxygens O by adding water, H2O. After that, what you do is you balance H, hydrogen, by adding H+, plus, and it has to be H+. Plus. The final thing that you need to do in this second step is you need to finish by balancing charges by adding electrons, E to the minus symbol, as needed. Now, the third uh, step in this process is to multiply each half reaction to make the number of electrons equal. The fourth step is to add the half reactions and simplify as necessary. And then the fifth and final step is to check to make sure the atoms and charges are balanced. All right, so let's put these steps to the test. And I would, I would keep those steps pretty handy uh, because it's going to help uh, with this process here. So we're just gonna shift gears and our example reaction, our, our final example for today here is we wanna use half reaction to balance a chemical equation between permanganate and oxalate ions in acidic solution. So first off, this is a, a little bit complicated here, um, but uh, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pause the video and show the reaction that should have been written in this portion of notes. So again, like I said, I, I wouldn't expect you to know this. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty difficult reaction and I, and I should have had it written in notes, but hey, it's there now. So the first step here is we need to write down the two incomplete reactions. So how we do this is we just break it down into the similar substances. So everyone see here how you have manganese and you have manganese with two plus. What happens here is, is one of those half reactions is this. We have MnO4 one minus, and you could just draw the arrow to be Mn2 plus. So essentially all we're doing here is we're finding these similarities here, and we're going from this. Uh, now the other half reaction would involve this C2O4, the oxalate ion, so C2O4 with a two minus charge um, is, going to have this CO2 on the product side. And now, uh, just, just so we know here, or just so you can see this, manganese, manganese here has a um, plus seven oxidation state, and over here it has a two plus. So it lost electrons, and so our oxidation is loss of electrons. So manganese, if you're noting this, manganese, this equation right here, is our oxidation half reaction. And then over here, this is our reduction half reaction. Okay, so now, if we move down to step two, it says balance each half reaction. And so we're just gonna do this one at a time. So I want you to pretend, hey, that what we just wrote down uh, don't worry about it for right now. We'll get to it here in a second. We're only going to concentrate on this top one here with manganese. So we need to balance 
elements other than hydrogen and oxygen. So we look here, okay, the only thing on the top part that we have that isn't hydrogen or oxygen is manganese. Well, manganese, there's one here, and there's one manganese uh, ion on the left, uh, excuse me, the right. So it's balanced, okay, so we can move on to the, the second portion of step two. Now we need to balance our oxygens by adding water, H2O. Well, we have four O's on the left, so what that means is that here on the right, we need to add four H2O's. And again, the way I knew I, I needed four is because we have four times one, four oxygens, and four oxygens on the left. Now the, the, the third part of step two is balance our H's by adding H+. Plus. Okay, what we did by adding four by adding four H2O's, by adding four waters, we now have four times two, we have eight hydrogens. So that means over here on the right, or excuse me, the left, we need to balance out those hydrogens by putting our H plus. Now the final part of step two, it says finish by balancing the charge by adding electrons as needed. So this is where the total overall charge comes into play. So over here on the left hand side, uh, we have our uh, eight times a positive one. So that's an eight plus charge plus a minus one. So eight plus a negative one over here on the left. That is a total of a, a positive seven. Over here on the right, we have a two plus charge and then water is a neutral compound here. And so we have a two plus charge. And so we need to think to ourselves, okay, this has a charge of seven plus, and we can only add electrons at this point. What that means is over here on the left, what we need to do is we need to add enough electrons to get the charges equal to two plus. We're at seven plus, we need to get down to two plus. So the way we do that is we add five electrons. So we just add five electrons to our left hand side. Okay, right now, that is all we can do. We have to go back to this bottom equation and do step two all the way through before we can go any further. So now we need to do this. All right, C2O4, uh, two minus and CO2. The first thing it says balance everything other than oxygen and hydrogen. Well, if you look here, we have two carbons and we only have one on the right. So what we need to do, we need to make this a two. And then it says, okay, now balance O by adding waters. Well, let's double check our O's. We have four, we have four um, O's from the left and then two times two, that is four O's there. So we don't need to add any water uh, because we already have it balanced. Then it says balance uh, our H's by adding H plus. Well, again, because we didn't add any water, we don't have to worry about that on that bottom portion. So we're good there. And then we need to finish by adding electrons so that the charges on each side of the equation uh, are even. So over here, we have a two minus charge. Over on the right, we have a neutral charge. So we need to get down to a two minus charge. So that means we need to add two electrons to that right hand side. Now we can move on to step three. So step three says multiply each half reaction to make the number of electrons equal. Well, the number of electrons here are five and two. So the first number that those things meet at is 10. So what we need to do, this entire top equation, to get to 10 electrons, we need to think five times what equals 10? Well, the number there is, is two. So we're gonna multiply everything on top by two, and I'm gonna rewrite it down below. So two times five is 10 electrons. Eight times two is 16 H plus. Two times MnO4 is two MnO4 
two minus two times mn two plus is two mn two plus and then four times two four times two is eight waters h2o now we need to get to 10 on the bottom so we multiply we think 2 times what equals 10 and we're trying to balance those electrons my answer is that is 5 so we're gonna have 5 C 2 O 4 2 minus and that is aqueous um, and then 2 times 5 is 10 CO2 and then 2 times 5 is 10 electrons okay so now what we need to do is it says add the half reactions and simplify as necessary so if we are adding these reactions right we're adding these things together if we have the same thing on the left as we do on the right like electrons we can cancel out and see how they're both 10 what this means is we can say hey we don't need that in our final equation now we can double check and look and see if anything else can cancel out the question or the answer to that is no so when we add these equations together what we end up doing is we will just have 16 H pluses plus 2 M N O 4 2 minuses plus 5 C 2 O 4 2 minus and then on the right hand side we have 2 M N 2 M N 2 plus we have 8 waters H 2 O and then we have 10 C O twos okay now um, again this is 10 this is 10 co2 I'm going to emphasize the um, there we go I'm going to emphasize our co2 Oop, that did not make it look good uh, and so again we have 16 H plus 2 mno 4 2 minus 5 c2 o4 2 minus 2mn2 plus 8 h2o's and that is uh on the the final portion here i'm gonna make it look try to look pretty here that is 10 co2s so that right there that right there i know it's a, a long process here but that is how we would balance our reaction uh, all right so i know this has been a, a long episode uh, but I hope you have enjoyed, and as always, make sure you subscribe.